Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour back in our Father's Word, Book of Hebrews. The word Hebrews is what foreigners usually call an Israelite. The Israelites themselves being, they call each other Israelites. But what, what does Hebrews mean? It comes from Eber, which means those that passed over the river. And that's what Hebrews means, those that crossed the river. That would be Abraham, who was first called that in the book of Genesis. And um, so it is that Paul, in writing this letter to his own, for he was of the tribe of Benjamin, of the house of Israel, Romans chapter 11, documenting that, verse 1. Then certainly um, he was in Hebrew himself even by birth. So having said that, chapter 3, verse 1, let's pick it up as we uh, take forward the Word of God. And it reads with that word of wisdom from our Father, Wherefore, holy brethren, partakers, or, or that's to say members of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. And you know how could we how could we consider anyone greater, one that would die for all men and never whimper about it, laid his life down at the cross, whereby he could defeat the devil, which is to say Satan, as we learned in chapter two, in verse fourteen, whereby we have that victory. He gave it all for us that simply on asking his forgiveness and repenting with thanksgiving, then we have that freedom of being cleansed. Uh, so you can't compare with that. And naturally, he being Emmanuel, that is to say, God with us. Verse 2, who was faithful to him that appointed him, that's our Father, as also Moses was faithful in all his house. Some of the others fell aside and as they were uh, taking the troops from Egypt. On the way out, there was complaining, and even his own sister and brother, Aaron and, and his sister, turned on him. And um, uh, you can, uh, in uh, Numbers 12, we read of that. Verse 3, For this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. And certainly, who builds the house? Christ does. He is the house. He makes up the many-membered body of Christ as the leader and the head. Uh, God himself would say in, in the book of Numbers that Moses, many prophets, he simply would reach by dream or something else. But he spoke one-on-one -on -one to Moses. Moses was special to him. And Moses never turned against him, even when the people would refuse to go into the promised land. Moses stayed true to Almighty God, and God accounted that as great, and, and how, how precious that is. Uh, and, um, uh, and, and I'm, I'm going to go, you're not going to have it, I'm going to go to Zechariah chapter 6, verse 12, and I want to read a little verse here. And, and speak unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. Now, th that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. 
It was written long ago that he would and he did. Verse 13 of the same chapter, Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Uh, and, and he was the, and is the Prince of Peace. And he will build that many, this is why as he was being tried at, at the um, uh, foot of the cross, so to speak, he said, destroy this building, the temple, and I'll rebuild it in three days. Meaning upon his resurrection, he started the ministry that has grown and has taken over the world as far as that's concerned, ultimately because you're either of that ministry or you're going to be hard pressed. That's God being the judge. He'll take care of that. Returning to chapter 3, verse 4. For every house is builded by some man, but he that built all things is God. In other words, you may build a house, but God grew the timber, God created the tree, God created the soil that the brick comes from. In other words, he created all things. So man can take the things of God and build something, but it is God that is the chief builder. I mean, it, it, it all stops right there for he is, he is the controller of all. He is the, the former of all in that he created all things. And, uh, and how precious it is, that's your father. It doesn't get any better than that. And he will never leave you, he will never forsake you. We are so very honored and, and blessed to have a father like this that loves his children. Everything he does and everything he ever created in creating all things. If you read the last verse of chapter 4 of the great book of Revelation, you find out he created it for his pleasure. Even his children pleasure him. That is to say, if they are a member of, of these partakers of the heavenly calling. And let's go with the next verse, please. Verse 5. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. In other words, he never wavered. He never fell away from it. As others would complain, you know, even as he was up on the mount, Mount Sinai, receiving the Ten Commandments. What were the people doing? He was gone 40 days and 40 nights. They grew restless and they made golden, a golden calf. They, they, they fell apart. Is it Mo, where's that Moses that brought us out in the wilderness to die? And when God spoke, they shook. But even that generation who God had shown signs of parting the Red Sea, destroying Pharaoh's army, feeding them manna from heaven and quail, that at the end of that 40 years, they still would not enter the promised land because they heard a rumor that giants were there, even though God said, it's clean, it's clear. <clears throat> they would not go. But this one Moses was that type of savior that still held true and, got, and, uh, and derived God's favor to bring that whole crew that other than those that did not make it, that generation that died in the wilderness because they refused God. But Moses never refused him. He was honorable right up to uh, even his very passing. Verse six to continue. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, the many-membered body, if we hold fast the confidence 
in the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. Now, a lot of people would say, well, you can see right there, we make it fine right up to the end. You may be overlooking one little word. Right, right in the, close to the center of this verse, there's a word that's if, if, if you qualify, if you fill the bill, if you're as true as you can be, though we all slip, though we all make mistakes oft times. But here, this one that would show us the way, and, and uh, if you hold that steadfast, not be some reed shaken in the wind. Too many people will listen to this teacher five minutes and another teacher over here, and, and they go back and forth. They never consult the Word of God. And it is God that has created all things. It is God that has written this letter to us, telling us how to find that peace, how to find that oneness in Him, how to be steadfast, how to be a, a, a pleasure to the living God, to be blessed by Him in return. For when you love our Heavenly Father, He always returns that love with blessings. It doesn't get any better than that, my friend. When, when it's too rough for everybody else, you, you, you can be pretty well protected but you're right in there with him, whatever your situation may be. So yeah, there's that little word, if, if you are steadfast, if you hold that line, if you hold that course. Verse seven, wherefore, as the Holy Spirit says today, if you will hear his voice, and naturally, what, what are we doing here? We're quoting the 95th Psalm, and it's important that we go there. Psalms 95, verse 7. Let's, let's read it. Give unto the Lord, O ye kindreds of the people, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring, all, bring an offering and come unto his courts. O oh, worship the Lord, and, and I've jumped to 96. I'm backing back up again to the seventh verse of 95. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand today. And here's what Paul was quoting. Today, if you will hear his voice. Well, how, how do we hear his voice? Through his word, the letter that he has sent to you, the written word, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, giving you instructions, giving you strength today. That means every day, but don't wait till tomorrow, today. Verse eight, harden not your heart as in the provocation and as in the day of temptation in the wilderness, like the children that made the golden calf. Verse nine, when your fathers tempted me, proved me and saw my work, I made quick work out of them. 10, 40 years long was I grieved with this generation. And I said, it is a people that do err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. Verse 11 to complete. Unto whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. And rest is Sabbath. In other words, it's setting us up for chapter four in this great book of Hebrews, which has to do with the Sabbath, what it means and how you find that rest. So it's today. That's when you find it, not tomorrow, not put off somewhere, but today, hearing the Father's voice and His touch through the very Word that He sends us. 
And we return then to chapter 3, and we'll pick it up. Paul will be repeating again some of the same scripture we just read in Psalms 95, beginning with verse 7 through 11. Verse 8, Harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of temptation in the wilderness. Quoting it right on. Paul was a great Bible scholar. Okay. Verse 9, When your fathers tempted me, proved me. That's, they challenged me and saw my works 40 years. You, you don't want to start challenging God. That's a good way to really get yourself in a fix. Verse 10, Wherefore I was grieved with, the gen with that generation. And I said, They do always err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. And, and, and it is difficult to understand how they possibly could do what they did. <clears throat> that here, uh, God at the beginning, saving that little baby, in a little basket in the Nile with Pharaoh's uh, family having claimed that boy and raised him. And he was none other than Moses. And that little sister that followed along in the reeds saying to that member of Pharaoh's family, I, I will find a nursemaid among the Hebrews. And naturally she brought Moses' mother to nurture this boy, and he would become great in Egypt. Uh, but at the same time, God would perform so many miracles through this one. Again, parting the Red Sea, destroying Pharaoh's army, um, feeding manna from heaven. That's angels' food. Feeding them that long 40 years. Or, you know, many people would have lost their control and just wiped them out early. Forty years. He suffered with them, showing them the Ten Commandments. And while Moses is bringing the Ten Commandments, they're, they've got an orgy going down at the bottom of the mountain. That's what God was dealing with. That's why he said, they challenged me. Don't ever challenge our Heavenly Father. I assure you it will pay no dividends other than a lot of trouble for you. So here we go then, next verse in 3, verse 11. So I swear in my wrath, God did, they shall not enter into my rest. And and here we have again a play on the word rest, which will be really drawn out in the next chapter, Sabbath. How do you find rest? The only way you can find rest is to have peace of mind. Where does peace of mind come from? Knowing that God is with you. Knowing, secondly, that you're pleasing to Him that you fulfill that big word, if, you're steadfast, you hold firm. People can count on you to, to know you're not going to be a reed shaken in the wind, to believe this five minutes and then something else. You're going to stay with this word, and you're going to find that rest. And it is a rest and a Sabbath that can be found in no other place is to have Christ in your life, to be a member of those with the heavenly calling, for they are blessed of God indeed, and God keeps his hand upon them, and that rest becomes a precious thing. You know, to be able to find rest when other people are so lost, so unhappy, so troubled, and you have that stability of the presence of the living God in your very life and family. How precious that is to be steadfast in His Word, listening 
and finding that rest, which is peace of mind, from that one that is so great, which is the apostle, the high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus, as foretold in verse 1 of this same chapter. Let's go with the next verse, please, verse 12. Take heed, brethren, you be careful, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. I'm, I mean forsaking him. That's what happened in the wilderness. They forsook God. And what, notice here what he calls an evil heart, one that doesn't, doesn't believe. With all that God has done in history through the Word of God, through actual events on this earth that are very transparent to those that care to take a look at, um, at, the ver at, at history and artifacts, that this word is true. And to be pleasing to God, again, it's so simple to be steadfast. But there are some that have an evil heart, and an evil heart is one of unbelief because they're not believers. They are not a member of the very first verse of this chapter, a member of the heavenly calling. That is, that is so very sad because he doesn't ask that much of you to be a member of that household, that house that he has built, that is to say his many-membered body, to follow him, to be with him in him, and to participate in that heavenly calling that you know where home is and home is with him because that is where you find your rest. You do not want unbelief to cause you to depart from the living God for the answer is then death and that you don't want. Verse 13, but exhort one another daily. You build each other up while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And um, do it today. Don't put it off. It's so easy to put off things, but, but be a friend to those that need a friend. And, and help them. Build them up and motivate them in the word of the living God, whereby they see that it's home to them. They're a part of it. They're a member of the holy heavenly calling, and they belong. It's a wonderful thing to belong. It is a lonesome, hard way to go without rest, to turn and twist, to seek and not find, because unbelief takes you over. If you, and then you, you know, sometimes someone like that will even say, if I could just only believe, why can't you? Because you have an evil heart. No one is born with an evil heart. That all you have to do is love him, follow him, and get rid of the disbelief and believe in his word, in his presence through the Holy Spirit, and be blessed. Uh, verse 14, to continue. For we are made partakers of Christ. If, now there's that word again, if what? If we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end, if you become a partner and you firmly hold that truth right to the very end, you're a member of that household. You're a member of that heavenly calling. You have attained eternal life. You have deserved it, uh, and he promises it to you. It's that simple to love him. How could you help but love him? He that has done all this for our people Verse 15, while 
it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Don't, don't, don't go stirring him up to anger. And there again, he's quoting Psalms 95, verse 7. Verse 16, for some, when they had heard, did provoke. Howbeit, not all that came out of Egypt by Moses, uh, they not not all made it. They just didn't make it. And and um, when when we go to Numbers chapter fourteen verse two, we we find out. Let's read it. You're not going to have it. I'll read it for you. And all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night. Verse 2, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron, and the whole congregation said unto them, Would God that we had died in the land of Egypt, or would God we had died in this wilderness? Verse 3, and wherefore hath the Lord brought us into this land to fall by the sword? that our wives and our children should be a prey, were, were it not better for us to return unto Egypt. Go right back into the snake's pit. And they said one to another, let us make a captain and let us return to Egypt. And then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all, all the assembly of the congregation and of the children of Israel. In other words, um, they begin to pray to God for leadership and to forgive this people. And, and God wa wanted to do away with them. But because Moses asked for protection of the people, not for himself, then God granted that and how precious it was. Returning then to the third chapter of the great book of Hebrews, verse 17. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Question. It sure wasn't Moses. Was it not with them that had sinned whose corcuses fell in the wilderness? They had it coming. You know, there is one thing, when you challenge God, when he has shown you you see, there was no excuse for them. They had seen the witness. They had seen the signs, as I, as I forestated. I truly have a hard time understanding how someone could see the parting of the Red Sea, the destruction of Pharaoh's army, and be fed angels' food from heaven for 40 years and still doubt what kind of people were these? And then they come to that Kadesh Barnea, and one day too late. That's why today is so very important that when you're dealing with our Heavenly Father, don't put it off. Let Him know that you love Him, and certainly uh, He will see that salvation comes to your door to your family, for those that believe, those that have a heart of belief, not a heart of unbelief. Verse 18, to continue. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believe not? There's one way you can rest assured, that you're never going to find that peace of mind. You're never going to find it without our Heavenly Father. Do you understand that He created your very soul in the first earth age? He, he knows what makes you tick. But He has demands. And that is that you treat other people properly, that you love Him, and, and uh, in returning that love, He will return His. And that in itself is basically a key that opens, that opens that house of rest, which is the presence of the living God, to have peace of mind.
to open your mind to his protection, to open your mind in belief to everything he has put before us, that it is yours for the taking, to love him, to honor him, and to be a part, a, a, part, a part of what was that? A part of the heavenly calling. That is to say, those that are going to make it into the eternity, that's where that rest basically is eternally. But you can have it today in peace of mind. One more verse to complete the chapter, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. Unbelief is a terrible thing. It, it is so difficult to understand why someone would not believe if you put any effort at all into, as I stated earlier, into artifacts alone and looking at what has happened on this earth in ancient history, as well as the very Word of God, His promise, and the Word of God that comes to pass a thousand years before it's even written. That should say something to you. Our Father knows what He's doing, and He's the one that prepared that place of rest. He makes it pretty easy. The ones that don't enter are the unbelievers. So naturally, to be a part of that membership with the heavenly calling is simply to believe and enter into that peace of mind, the rest which comes with eternal life. All right, bless your hearts. Don't miss the next lecture. It's about that rest. Listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, and all over Canada. If the spirit moves and you have a question, share it. Won't you do that? Please never ask a question about a particular reverend denomination or organization, we're not going to judge people. We have a judge, that's our Father. He can, he can handle it. You do have the right for spiritual discernment. It's discernment, a gift from God to know whether you're hearing truth or fiction. So let that be a blessing to you. That's part of his rest. Those of you that listen by short wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer. At the end of the hour, we'll give you our mailing address. Always a pleasure. Now, got a prayer request. You don't need the number or an address. God knows what you're thinking right now. He does. And do you know what he wants from you? Hosea 6.6, 6, I do not want your burnt offerings. I want your mercy, your love. That's what God wants from you. So you, you give him that love and he will return uh, tenfold in loving you in return and with blessings uh, from on high. That's a precious place to be and never forget about it. Let's go to his throne, Father, around the globe. We come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father, touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father, amen. Okay, and questions. We're gonna go with Debbie from Illinois. And thank you for your teaching. You are so very welcome. 
if someone accepts the Lord and asks to be forgiven for their sins on their deathbed, how do they fit into God's overall plan in heaven? Well, th this is something we're not to judge. They're certainly going to make it. They're heaven bound. They repented and that's what is necessary to be heaven bound. Now, I, I could say, and this is certainly not said in judgment, but in knowledge from God's word, that in Revelation chapter 19, as we read seven, verses seven and eight, it states that our fine linen that our robes are made out of are woven from our righteous acts. Well, how many righteous acts does a person on a deathbed conversion have? Uh, we don't know, do we? I've known people that hasn't professed to know God that lived a life of a lot of righteous acts and they loved the Lord. It's just that they hadn't gone to a church and committed themselves. But on their farms and in doing their work, they had committed themselves to God. So you see, when you start judging people, you're getting into an era that you, uh, an area that you know nothing about. That's why God said, let me do the judging. So naturally, all we can say is, they certainly are going to make it. Sammy from Wisconsin, when we pass away and go to heaven, do we still have the same names we are called on earth? Well, I hope some of our, what people call us gets changed a little bit, you know. I, I jest, but there, there's no reason why it shouldn't be. That's your identifier. And, and, and never forget, God said something that is very meaningful uh, coming out the gate. He said, let us create man in our image. This is why he could say in St. John chapter 14, through Christ and Christ speaking, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. They're exactly alike, okay, uh, in a different dimension. Same person, different dimension. So uh, that's pretty easy to follow if you th think and give it a little thought. So if he doesn't change your appearance, I doubt he would change a name. John from California. Is the rapture mentioned anywhere in the Hebrew manuscripts? Absolutely, definitely not. The rapture is not found in the Word of God. It is true that we, it is mentioned that we will at the seventh trump gather in the air, but that word air is not what most people think it is. It isn't atmosphere. The word in the Greek is simply the ambient air that you breathe, meaning what? At the seventh trump we change into our spiritual breath of life bodies, which is to say your spirit body, the pneuma, uh, and, and so it is. But the word rapture, you know, what the, what the uh, hurt, and this is where unbelief can certainly be dangerous. If you believe a false statement, such as you don't have to study God's word, you're gonna be gone then you haven't been taught that the Antichrist comes first. And when Antichrist shows up, he looks like Christ. He will talk like Christ. Revelation chapter 13, verses 11 says, he, he looks like the lamb slain, got horns, but it's the voice of the dragon, which means it's none other than Satan. And what is his message? I'm gonna gather you away. Bring all your family that doesn't believe in here and let's talk to them. And if, if you've been taught falsely, that unbelief will make you a Satan worshiper if you're not real careful in ignorance because you did not study God's word to believe and 
absorb the steadfastness of staying firm in his word. <clears throat> okay, uh, Fern from Michigan. Would you please tell me how we know or determine what Trump we were in, we are in? Someone told me we didn't actually know. Well, we should. We're, you know, first of all, when you study the book of Revelation, what does chapter 7 say there? The four winds, which always bring about the end of this earth age, were about to blow and says, stop. We must put the seal of God in the forehead of, of his elect, so to speak. That means the truth of what's going to fall must first be taught. So the fifth seal and the fifth trump are times of teaching, of placing that seal in the minds of people. And then the false messiah always appears at the sixth seal, sixth trump, and the sixth vial. Well, he has not appeared yet physically. Spiritually, his evil spirit has been here. But physically, he will come. He is supernatural, and he will deceive many people. That's why it's important that the fifth seal, fifth trump, be taught to the people before the fact of the sixth trump. Uh, Joseph from, from Georgia. I'm Joseph. I'm 11 years old. You can preach very good. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. And your staff does a good job, too. Well, we're, we're proud of them. They, they hang in there. Here is my question. Will dinosaurs be in heaven? Keep up the good word of God. Bless you. Uh, uh, you bless your day. Well, thank you, Joseph. I appreciate that. <clears throat> now, in, we have a clue. And you can find it in, in, um, Le in Isaiah chapter 11. It gives you the list of animals that are in heaven, so to speak, in spiritual bodies. And, and God loves his animals. So it is possible that he will bring back the dinosaur in the spiritual form. But we do know that most of the animals we have on earth today or mentioned there, with the exception that uh, those that were carnivores in this earth age are not there. They all eat the same thing. And um, as you can read in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 11, meaning there is no flesh for them to eat because everything is spiritual. The bodies are. Okay, this would be, this would be Patricia from North Carolina. And I'm trying to spot your question. Okay, here it is. I still have a question. Although it most likely won't be answered till the heavens open and we're transformed, I was adopted. So I have no blood relatives to my knowledge. I am age 63 and a half. Concerning the Gulf, Ezekiel 44:25, who would or could counsel me if need be? I'm, I most sincerely do the best I can to help lend a hand, use patience, and to be productive. But we, none of us, are perfect. Therefore, I wonder, will I make it? Well, you, what? You don't have family. You have the Christian family. There's uh, only a Gentile is adopted into the Christian family, okay, the house of Israel. And uh, so you, you, you're traveling in good company. Uh, you know, when God said, I will never leave you or forsake you, he was talking to you. So you want to be real careful about saying you don't have anyone because that would mean you were an unbeliever, and it's obvious you're not because you're trying your best. That makes you a believer and makes you a child of the living God. 
he's your father and your father will always stick up for you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. You enter into his rest. Find peace of mind and stop worrying about that because it would be a waste of time for you. Let him know rather that you love him. John from North Carolina, you make reference to the Chaldee language in the King James Bible. What is that or where can I find more information on that? Does your companion Bible that you use, does it reference the Chaldee language? Yes, it does. The manuscripts are very specific. Let's take the book of Daniel. When you come to chapter two, in the middle of the second verse, where they began in the captivity, it says, and they spoke in Syriac, which is, there are five dialects of the Chaldee, and it is Syriac or Aramaic. And all the time they were in the captivity, from that chapter two, verse two, the manuscripts are in Syriac, Aramaic or Chaldee up until the seventh chapter where freedom comes, where they are free from, from uh, Nebuchadnezzar. And then it goes back to their, their native tongue in the manuscripts, laying it out. Uh, Flora from Mississippi, could you please explain to me about the rapture? Are those born again in Christ going to be here when Antichrist is here, I'm confused. That's not a good time to be confused about this. There, the word rapture is not in the Bible. Most people take it from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. They forget to read chapter, verse 13 and 14 to find out what the subject is. If you, if you don't know what the subject is, you sure don't know what the rest of it's talking about. The subject then is fixed. If you believe Christ rose from the dead, then you better believe all those that sleep or are dead in him have risen also. They're not out here in some hole in the ground. That's the subject. And it says there's no way we can precede them. Why? They're gone. They're out of here. And But at the seventh trump, we will gather them back to them in a spiritual, spiritual body, and, and so it is. Um, you would have to do away with most of God's Word that instructs His children how they are to stand prophetically and otherwise against the false one. So there's no way they can be flowing out and still participate in what God's elect are supposed to do here on earth when that false one comes first at the sixth trump. Christ doesn't return until the seventh. If you ever read the book of Revelation, Christ doesn't return until the seventh trump. The Antichrist comes at the sixth trump. Uh, er, Ira from, from Georgia, I'm um, trying to pick up on your question. Pastor Murray, will you please answer this question to me? It is is uh, a sacrifice, I think is what you said, to give all of my money away, knowing that I have bills to pay and they had gone up. I get one Social Security check each month, every month. After that, I don't get any more. I read Malachi 3.10 and giving one-tenth of my, your check to get. I need eyeglasses and they want me to give them four or five gifts at one time plus put a gift on my credit card where I don't use. Don't, um, you know, when, when you uh, never borrow money, to pay a tithe. A tithe is what you earn money for, not disability money. You don't earn that. That is to sustain you and to pay your bills with and to feed you. So don't, don't let some 
someone come along and tell you that you have to give all of your money to them and let your bills slide. That won't cut it. That's a good way to lose your home, to, to uh, get yourself so far in debt wh where all you have is kind of a disability to, to live on, then you can't make it and God doesn't expect it. What, is, what, do, you, what do you owe when you don't work? Well, how much did you make? I made zero. Well, what is 10% of zero? It's zero. You don't owe anything. Why? Because you don't have anything. Just thank God for the hand you have in helping that um, your disability and Social Security helps you pay those bills and provides for you and don't let someone beat you out of it. Dennis from Illinois. My question is about the abomination of meat, the pig being unclean, Acts chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. Peter had a vision and God told him to get up and kill. To me, that sounds like he made the animals that were unclean clean, but I don't know. Please explain. Well, you sure don't know because he didn't. What Did he ever eat the unclean animals or did he ever kill them? Answer, no. God took them away. But then when you continue reading, the intelligence of the statement is that Cornelius' people were approaching the gate when this happened, his front gate. They were Gentiles, called common or unclean by the Israelites. And what God was telling Peter is, don't you dare call any man common or unclean from this point forward. If they loved the Lord Jesus Christ, and certainly Cornelius did, he sent for Peter to preach to them and his whole house was converted because they believed. So uh, it had nothing to do with food. If, if you want to read what the New Testament has to say about uh, the food laws, you would have to go to uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and you would want to go down to verse 3 where it says, don't let anyone judge you in marriage and don't let anyone judge you in food that you receive that God created to be received. Now, there's certain scavengers God didn't create to be received. They will make you sick. They will make you ill. And God knows it. That's why he says it's against his law to eat them. So therefore, uh, then it will go on and say, all animals are good. Yeah, for the purpose they were created. The scavenger is here to clean the filth and grime and disease off the earth. You don't then turn around and eat the diseased, filthy animal. You eat what God has put before you clean. Uh, Augustino from California. I enjoy your program. It has enlightened me as to what is going to happen. I'm 90 years old. Well, bless you. I heard you say the other day that the soul went into the lake of fire. I thought you could not separate the soul from the spirit. Is the spirit still alive if you send the soul into the lake of fire? Just wanted to know. Now, now naturally, let's qualify this a little bit, though. As it is written in Revelation chapter 20, only those that follow Satan at the end of the Lord's day go into the lake of fire, not believers. So what it is, is God is a consuming fire. So what, what it means is he consumes or blots out. In other words, that soul doesn't exist any longer. If you put a mark down and blot it out, it's gone. This is why there won't be any tears in heaven. There won't, uh, there won't be anyone there. You know, a lot of people would paint heaven with a big lake of fire and people are out there burning forever and ever and that's heaven. That, that's certainly no picture of heaven. 
Heaven has total, complete rest, no tears, and, and no sadness. Why? Because that's all gone. So the, um, the spirits that do go into the lake of fire are wicked followers of Satan that have not the right to live. And God simply uh, bluffs them out. Chris from California. Simplify and right back to you. When we are in heaven and we don't get old, how will we know our loved ones? Well, they're there and they don't get old either. Um, you know, instinct and uh, our Father's will lets us know family, all right? But the, the whole world is our family. And that's what you really need to be thinking in that light. Uh, not, not that you should overlook your loved ones or cut them out of anything. I'm out of time. I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word. Most of all, God loves you for it. Hey, it makes His day. And when you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. You can count on it. You bless Him. He will always bless you. Now, we are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we have helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Won't you do that? When, when you bless God, He will always bless you. He will open the doors to that place of rest. It's priceless to find that rest, that peace of mind. And when He says, come on in, He loves you for that. And most important, though, you listen to me, listen good. Stay in His Word every day. And His Word's a good day because Christ is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645 